answer to simply walk in newness of life. Then to the Philippian Christians, the same writer penned that he rejoiced in the day of Christ that he had not run in vain. So let's spend the next half hour connecting some of these thoughts, especially likening the Christian experience to that of a physical running race, hence my title, The Prize, which is usually the main reason for any athlete's participation in a race, now, when it comes to serious athletics, the burning desire to compete has possibly been generated early in a person's life and has usually been the result of natural ability or passion. Or maybe one of the parents had excelled in a particular sport or discipline and a son or daughter was encouraged to carry along along the same lines. It could, could even have been someone outside the family, maybe a mentor, who had observed a rare natural talent or gift in the person or child and planted the seed that initiated enough desire to have them set out and strive for the ultimate in any one of many fields of sport or endeavour. Wherever or however the spark or germ takes hold is immaterial, as there could be any number of circumstances that could contribute to an individual's decision to embark upon that which I have just mentioned. To trim this introduction down to a few words, we could just term it in pursuit of the ultimate goal. As for today's few thoughts, I considered it would be a, an appropriate, it, it would be appropriate to con concentrate along the lines of a physical running race. The type Paul the Apostle used in the spiritual sense or an analogy to compare with a Christian experience. I'm sure in the days of the Romans there were all kinds of physical sport of strength, skill, courage, endurance, etc. However, it's running that appeals to me today, seeing I plan to refer to God's word along the way. So let's say we have settled on our athlete. The next thing that takes place in the mind of this potential champion, and which cannot be avoided or bypassed, is the consideration of the cost, the effort that's going to be ever ongoing. Without a let up, this side of a certain date, which will always be present in the person's mind. And so for the cost, yes, it could be part monetary, which would usually be the less of it to deal with, like travel to a gym or minor other events, etc., held in distant locations. But yes, the real cost, physical, is the one to which I principally refer, which will entail gruelling training sessions that tax the physical body and as well the mental elements of even the finest physical frame. And there are no shortcuts along the way. So whatever has got to be done as regards training simply has to be done, whether one feels like it or not. Sickness is the one and only excuse to forego training. Everything else has to be fitted in or slotted in so as to not interfere with a training schedule. And as far as equipment is concerned, it has to be the best available because your training runs are going to take place on every type of surface, including sand, in order to strengthen every muscle, ligament, and joint of the body. And the lungs and heart 
are similarly taxed to the limit. And they in turn will let you know in no uncertain terms when they too have had enough. Sometimes you, you can get on a high and breeze through training and feel fantastic. Other times you grind to depressing lows and you wonder what you have let yourself in for. Depression can very easily take hold. But you're the one who made the initial decision and you're the one who took into account what the cost would be. So the onus is on you to see it through and hopefully succeed. Because it certainly won't come already dished up on a plate and ready to enjoy. That is victory I'm alluding to. Not forgetting the prize which always comes at the end. Now the next consideration for the athlete will be along the lines of a scientific approach. Such can result in a person trying different styles of running techniques in order to establish the one that best suits their body structure. Then to a strategy to use in the course of the actual race. Because if you have not got a naturally good built-in sprint finish at, finish at the end, you have to possibly be able to set a cracking pace throughout the race so as to try and burn off those others, you know, who have a strong finish. Then too, one needs to plan the race so as to ensure one doesn't allow oneself to become boxed in on the final lap with no way through and being forced to run wide and as a result having to cover additional ground expending extra precious energy. Also, one has to be extra vigilant concerning the possibility of being jostled and thrown out of rhythm at any stage of the race. And coming up the home straight towards the tape, sometimes a glance over a shoulder could pay off to check those who are just as determined in racing for glory a crown, and making a surge for victory. But then if you have a withering finish, you know in your heart that on the back straight, if you aren't leading, that you have the power and strength to overtake those ahead of you and be first to breast the tape. There's an awful lot of benefit to be gained from a first-class scientific approach. Timing is also important, as the athlete will hopefully try to peak in his performance just prior to a competition event. Plus, there will always be a few secret tricks one would try in the hope of enhancing a performance. So far, there's natural ability and desire to compete. Next to this is the acceptance of the cost, i.e. physical, mental, monetary. Then there is the scientific approach. However, I haven't made mention yet of another most important factor, which is an absolute must. That is, if one plans to aim for the ultimate, it goes without saying that a coach bar trainer is the one person who cannot be discounted. To further emphasise this, one would be crazy to not seek out the very best individual available. A person who has possibly been a previous champion and acquired a massive knowledge along the way and who has the gift of imparting his many secrets. Plus, of course, you have to be able to get along well with this person because it's not all one-way traffic. It's a combination effort where the coach bar trainer is constantly taking on board the regular views and observations of the one he is encouraging, which in turn results in a worthwhile and workable arrangement. 
This is a person you strive to please, and so you are forever trying real hard to do your best for him or her, because you know this person is dedicated as well to getting the very best out of you and will sacrifice no end to achieve this. And yes, this is a person who can spot bad habits that unknowingly can creep into an athlete's program. And if necessary, he may even annoy his potential champion in order to rid him or her of such bad habits. But conversely, will never fail to encourage and inspire when progress is being noticed or made. You could conclude this person is the main driving force and inspiration, a person you can trust implicitly and have faith in, one who you know can deliver as long as you are prepared to do your part as faithfully. And yet there is still something else that needs to be taken into account now, it would only be a fool athlete who would not give serious thought to the study of an appropriate diet and relaxation regime. These two go hand in hand, so if one wants the very best in output, one is obliged to partake of the very best of input, food and drink, etc., and to assist mentally, relaxation also has to be included. I guess this forms part of the scientific approach, really. The correct type and quality of food to produce a storage of energy and with a bit of reserve to fall back on if required is also a wise consideration. And a good coach bar trainer should also have some regard in this regard respect. It all boils down to a correct balance involving every aspect of an athlete's every day and night life. And as far as sufficient sleep goes, such is absolutely essential because if you break down muscle tissue and training, the body requires adequate rest time to build this up again. Then there's that calendar date marked of the future, the meet or the fixture, the event, which is never far from an athlete's mind. After all, it's the precise date where one is planning all the way through to endeavour to peak in his performance or her performance. It's not a haphazard timetable. It's a program tailor-made so as to arrive at a specific date, knowing in yourself you have undertaken all the necessary steps along the way to bring you to this date in superb condition and rearing to go. If it's an Olympic Games event, one will be aware of where the race has been scheduled for and when to the very minute taking into account elimination processes, etc. All of this is not far from one's mind. It's always there in the background, even though the coach has it under control. The next item is also a reality and can add unnecessary baggage to every stage of the build-up. So what is this other thing? I would describe as a little nuisance. It seems to always be not far away. Well, it's the expectation of family and friends. We've already mentioned the standard the coach expects, but for interested others, there's always that continual inquiry. How's progress? How's training? Are you reaching your goals? We are expecting big things of you. You won't let us down, will you? expectation of the media and all manner of hype, etc., all of absolutely no benefit whatsoever to the dedicated athlete. It's nevertheless just a, another unnecessary impediment to which one can well do without. 
All such interest and exposure, no matter how genuine and sincere it comes across, is of no benefit. Thankfully, the build-up is complete and it's not long now before the event will get underway. Soon that moment of truth has arrived and there is an elite group of athletes on their starting blocks ready to contest the final, the elimination series having already been run. The starter gun is sounded and they all lunge forward. It's not long now before the strung out group round the corner onto the back straight and head for the tape. It's going to be very close, but apart from a rear dead heat, only one will prevail and be first to break the tape. For this person, a dream has come true. There will be the presentation of a gold-plated medal, the prize. Loads of acclamation, newspaper reports, and homecoming welcome, etc., etc. There is not one who would be in disagreement. It's all paid off. That is, the effort and cost. It's all been worthwhile, as any winner would attest. The Dais experience is something very few people ever get to be a part of, with one's national anthem being played and his or her nation's flag being hoisted in the centre position. All of this could boil down to elation at its best. Closer to home, I'm sure at least some in the congregation will have had a winner's experience during their lifetime. If it was sport orientated, such persons would have no trouble identifying with a particular training program that was the precursor to their success. Now, if I can be permitted, the last time I had this feeling of elation was at a New Zealand weightlifting championship event held here in Wangarei some 40 years ago. I won't bother you with detail in respect of that Saturday night. The point is that I too had to adhere strictly to a certain training schedule for many months prior to what was to me a very memorable evening. And there were many highs and lows along the way as I strove to become stronger and lift more, knowing I would have to compete in the heavier division due to my natural body weight class being held during the Sabbath hours. However, without a trainer or coach and little interest from the local club due to the Sabbath, I had negotiated intensely with my Lord in prayer over many months beforehand. That night he gave me the victory over four much heavier opponents and as well a New Zealand record in this heavier class. So as I said previously, you will have to forgive me for this little bit of personal history. It was only included so as to blend some extra variety to Paul's comparison between the physical race with that of the spiritual race where winning is the number one priority. Now at this stage I would like to take the liberty to rework some of Paul's thoughts. They will of course be along the lines of his analogy between the two different type races. Aren't you Corinthian believers aware that the Christian experience or new better way of life is very similar to that of a physical running race where you all line up against each other with each making their very best effort to win? However, in spite of the intensity of training each has engaged in over a period of time, Yet only one competitor is going to win and receive the prize. 
It's as simple as that. But in reality, this type of prize is just a corruptible crown. It is going to fade and be forgotten in next to no time at all. So in contrast, what I really want to bring to your attention is the crown or prize that every last one of you can attain to and in fact must attain to. That is, if you are serious about the prospect of eternal life in the hereafter, this is perceived as the incorruptible crown or prize that fadeth not away, but shines forever in the form of newness of everlasting life to every runner. But let me again return to the physical race. You will most probably be aware that one needs to be balanced or temperate in all areas connected with your training. What I'm trying to say is that you don't just thrash around, flailing the air like an uncontrolled idiot, hoping for the best outcome. No, you control every part of your body all the time in the course of your spiritual race and never, no never, let it control your mind. Again, I'm trying to emphasise that if need be, you bring it your body, that is, into subjection all the time. That's if you plan on success, which is to simply be confident about finishing your individual race. But referring again to the physical race, there is always only one absolute winner, no question about it. However, in the spiritual race, we all, as I've tried to emphasise, have to be winners. But it's not a matter of being first to the tape. Rather, it's a matter of getting to the tape not f and not falling by the wayside and staying down in the process. That's the difference. Paul also carried on with another good tip for those seriously involved in this race for life event. It is to simply lay aside every weight, which makes a lot of sense, and as well those sins that can so easily beset us or hinder our progress, and run with patience this spiritual race that is set before every Christian person. Patience. Yes, because sometimes it's for a lifetime and right up and into old age. So let's pursue this type of race a bit more thoroughly. You have most probably guessed it's the marathon event, a lifetime of relentless running. The entrant having been entered in and nourished from birth by two born-again Christian parents. It's a long journey and can be fraught with every kind of experience under the sun. That is, every kind of adverse experience known to mankind. And the Christian athlete is not immune to such regular testing situations. The Apostle Paul certainly had his ups and many downs along the way in his journey to the, to the tape or finishing line. And yet, friends, there is nothing to equal the satisfaction gained from having a wonderful relationship experience with the most successful coach and mentor of all time, Jesus Christ. He it is who supplies the living water and energy drink along the way. When there is searing heat that brings on exhaustion and dehydration. He it, is, he it is who has shared every ounce of his vast experience with every entrant in this race of a lifetime and his encouragement is second to none. It's unending, indeed. It has to be seeing there are all of life's vicissitudes thrown into the mix not forgetting the allurements that are there along the way to distract even the most determined runner. No, friends, 
nothing eerie fairy about what one might encounter in the process of running in this life, in the race of life event. And some of us are old enough to know. Temptations? Yes. But the promise of power to counter these, even a much bigger yes. So we all journey on to the end of our life, the end of our race, and the prize that awaits every person who has persevered to the end. Now, friends, at this stage, if you really want to know the secret to all of these hints and tips regarding the race of life, well, here it is in a nutshell from our writer, Paul the Apostle. We have already touched on his introduction. However, this time, I will read it in the context of the complete thought. Paul speaking, let us lay aside every weight and sin or sins which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, continuing and giving us the secret which is looking unto Jesus, the author or one responsible for our our involvement in this race of life and as well the finisher of our faith. Friends, he it is who sees us through to the very end, whether or not our race be a short version, sprint, or the marathon event of a lifetime. But then too, there is another side to all this, which is that Jesus had to pass his father's stringent test in order to qualify the coaching role of runners for all time. Yes, friends, he had to disregard the weight of shame that pressed so heavily upon him, culminating in his death upon the cross, all for the joy of coaching every runner to the end of their personal race. You will have observed that I have only commented on the marathon running event in this analogy between their physical and spiritual races. So what about all these other intermediate distances between the marathon and sprint events? To name a few, the 10,000 metres, the 5,000 metres, the 3,000 metres, 1,500 metres, 800 metres, 400 metres, finishing up with the two and 100 metre sprints. Not forgetting the various hurdle events. I don't think they had the triathlon event in Paul's day. No push bikes, not much water either. I think there used to be a steeplechase or cross country event with all manner of obstacles built into the course. Let's see for a few moments if we can translate some of these distances into real-life Christian experiences, walks or races, etc. Distant walking is, of course, also a competition event. To begin with, there is the 100-metre sprint. We could say some of these persons have put off the lifetime race until the very last minute. Health could even have been one of the many reasons. With not much time left in life to train, they hurriedly make the most of a last minute situation. A coach, the right coach, has been waiting patiently for this very important moment and inspires them to the finishing line where a crown or prize awaits them. And just as wonderful as the marathon entrant who toiled over a lifetime in his event. Remember, folks, Jesus' parable of the workers. Some worked all day, as against others who worked just for part of a portion of the day. Each received the same wage at the end of the day. Then there is the 200 metre sprint. Not unlike the 100 metre dash, it too is an all-out sprint. This person has had little, a little bit more time to weigh up the prospect of a crown or prize and gets down to quick business of making that tape 
experience a reality and succeeds. Praise the Lord. The same coach was hired. I'm sure we know of some wise persons who have finally made a decision to sprint to the end of their personal spiritual race. Then there are some in the 400 metres and 800 metres races who have got quite a bit further through life that have likewise responded to the same coach's invitation to begin running or sprinting to the end of their changed lives and for the same prize. The 1500 metres, quite a bit more distant to run, same coach, same successful result at the end and same prize or crown. Praise the Lord again. The 3,000 and 5,000 metre spiritual race suggests that these persons had entered these events maybe midway through life, discovered the true coach and faithfully ran to their distances, received their prizes and joined all others. Lastly, there is the gruelling 10,000 metre race. Not over an entire lifetime, nevertheless, a lot of time and distance. Like a mini marathon event, take in many trials and tribulations along the way to the finishing line. And of course, same prize and crown at the end. As regards the hurdles races, one can knock a few over and stumble as a result. But the determined athlete sprints on regardless to the end to their prize. One final sobering thought, friends, with a lot of truth in it. There is a person who has only coasted along for far too much of their Christian journey or race and have not heeded their coach's advice to become more dedicated and move with more faith and confidence. But thankfully, at last, with life running out on them and the sudden feeling of urgency, they put on a sprint to the end of their journey and ultimately rejoice in their prize of eternal life. There's a question that each one of us could do well to consider, which is, when did each one of us enter God's race of life? What is the distance that represents our race to the tape? Is it one of the distant events or one of the shorter sprint races. Following the Apostle Paul's letter to the young Timothy, where he wrote that he had fought a good fight, he went on to state, I have finished my course. Continuing, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which he said he would receive at that day along with every other who was looking forward to Jesus appearing. A crown or prize of righteousness. Now the way I interpret this is a new, incorruptible, everlasting life of perfection, devoid of sin or any taint of it, to be lived for the first part in God's eternal city in heaven, and thereafter returning to planet Earth in its refurbished state of perfection. To live in joy, happiness and exploitation of every beautiful gift and adventure of which our present minds are way too small to remotely imagine. But I've skipped over a very important bit, haven't I? which is in respect of that banquet of all banquets being prepared by a coach bar trainer and host, Jesus Christ, to take place after our arrival in heaven, which incidentally, distance-wise, is situated way past what is referred to as the black hole in space, which is calculated at a mere 14 billion light years away. No problem, though, for Jesus to arrange that sort of space travel for the redeemed. So getting down to the ditty-gritty, 
what's the secret or qualification to being included in this vast throng of successful Christian athletes? Well, here it is for one last time. Quote, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, our race or journey begins with him and ends with him in victory and that crown or prize, eternal life. I encourage each one of you, like the Apostle Paul, to never, ever give up your race, but rather to strongly finish your course with a victory lap of appreciation to Jesus Christ. The end. Right, our last hymn, uh, you should all be familiar with this closing hymn. However, I've taken the liberty to alter some of the words, as you will readily note. So for today only, I'm calling it the Athlete's Version. Let's see if we can sing it with real passion. Thank you, Mike. Please, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing and bless us, please, especially in this untried week ahead. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.